Have you ever wondered why you have a lymphatic system and what its actual job is? Well, you may have been told that it has something to do with your immune system, and you may have even experienced a swollen gland or lymph node when you've been sick. And although it is true that your lymphatic system plays a major role in your body's defenses, it also plays a huge role in maintaining fluid and water balance throughout your body. Without this system, your tissues would swell and balloon up like the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. And so today, we're going to discuss how this system plays not only a vital role in your immunity, but also by draining excess fluid from the tissues, helping to reduce swelling. And also, how it gets involved in the healing process with certain injuries. And even talk a little bit about how you can assist your lymphatic system with movement, exercise, and why treatments like elevation and compression can assist with the healing process. It's going to be a liquidy one. So, let's do this. So to help us fully understand the functions and why we have a lymphatic system, let's break down the anatomy of the lymphatic system, or in other words, break it down into its various parts. The lymphatic system is made up of four key components. The lymph, which is the fluid that circulates through the lymphatic system, and as we're going to learn in just a second, the lymph originally came from your blood. Next we have the lymphatic vessels. These are the tubular highways that transport the lymph through your body. And these lymphatic vessels are very similar to veins. And as we'll see soon, they begin as small lymphatic capillaries and gradually merge into larger lymphatic vessels. We also have the lymphatic tissue and organs. Many of these you have likely heard about, as these include your lymph nodes, spleen, tonsils, and the thymus. And last, we have your red bone marrow. This is actually classified as a connective tissue that is located deep within your bone, specifically suspended within the spongy bone. And as you can see from this really cool picture, the spongy bone architecture is amazing. But this red bone marrow produces red blood cells, white blood cells, and your platelets. So now that we know the structures in the tissues that make up the lymphatic system, let's learn about one of the coolest and essential functions of this system, and that is draining excess interstitial fluid. Now, if you haven't heard of interstitial fluid before, that's okay. I'm going to explain what it is and where it comes from. But pretty much, if you didn't have a lymphatic system, you would swell up, again, kind of like the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. So here's how this works. Every second of every day, your heart is pumping blood to your tissues. The heart does this by pumping blood into your arteries, and these arteries will start to branch into smaller arteries as they travel to specific tissues. And as the arteries continue to get smaller, they become arterioles. And this is what you can see in this picture here. This red tube is representing the arterial. And these arterioles will then flow into a capillary, which you can see the arterial branching into these tubes that are starting to get more of a purplish color. And I'll refer to these capillaries as blood capillaries from here on out to distinguish them from a lymphatic capillary. But at this blood capillary, this is where the magic happens. Blood capillaries allow for the exchange of nutrients such as oxygen and glucose, as well as metabolic byproducts such as carbon dioxide and lactate from lactic acid, for example. So for a specific example here, let's say we have oxygen moving through the blood capillary. The oxygen would temporarily move from that blood capillary into this black space here between the capillary, blood capillary, and the cells here, and this is called the interstitial space. Remember the space for later. And then it would move from this interstitial space into the cell, whereas the carbon dioxide would move from the cell temporarily into that interstitial space, but then it would move into the actual blood capillary. And once it's in that blood capillary, the blood capillary is going to flow up into a venule, and that venule will then flow into a larger vein, and that blood will eventually make it back to the heart and the lungs, where in the case of carbon dioxide, we can breathe out and get rid of some of that with breathing out the carbon dioxide in the lungs. But back to this interstitial space, again, the space between the blood capillary and the cells. Not only do nutrients and waste products exchange between the blood capillaries and the cells, but fluid, some of the plasma from the blood, will also leak out of the blood capillary and into this space. And we then just call it interstitial fluid. But this is also how your cells get water and replenish their cytosol. And what is extremely important about this is that a balance must be maintained, meaning there needs to be a balance of how much fluid is distributed between the blood plasma the interstitial space, and within the cells. Otherwise, we're going to have some problems. 
Now there are multiple mechanisms that can help maintain this balance. But what is very important to understand about this whole process is that there is a net loss of fluid from that blood capillary. And what I mean by that is that more fluid leaks out of the blood capillary and into this black interstitial space that we have on the picture than the amount that is reabsorbed back into the capillary. And so if this continues, you would continue to accumulate more fluid in that interstitial space and your tissues would start to swell and eventually, again, go to my favorite reference of looking like the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. But fortunately for you, you have a drainage system known as the lymphatic system. Before a significant amount of interstitial fluid starts to accumulate in that interstitial space, your lymphatic capillaries that you can see in green start to drain or suck up this fluid and these lymphatic capillaries will flow into lymphatic veins and eventually into larger lymphatic ducts. And then guess where you take it? Right back to where it came from and into the blood. The lymphatic ducts drain back into the blood at the junction of the internal jugular vein and the subclavian vein. So as you can see, we've got this elegant system that ensures fluid balance, prevents swelling, also known as edema, and keeps your cardiovascular system humming along smoothly. And as an FYI, on average, about three liters of interstitial fluid are returned to the bloodstream every day. And let me give you a few real world examples. Have you ever wondered why your ankles can sometimes swell up after sitting for too long? Well, it's because your lymphatic system isn't draining fluid as effectively when you're stationary. There's not a lot of pressure in your lymphatic vessels. So much of the lymphatic flow and therefore movement of the lymph relies on muscle contractions especially in the lower limbs where gravity tends to push that fluid downward away from the heart. So movements such as walking, running, and just contracting the muscles of the lower limbs help squeeze those lymphatic vessels. Kind of think of it as your muscle contractions milking the lymphatic fluid upward. And like some of the veins throughout the body, lymphatic vessels have one-way valves, which is important because let's say you did a few muscle contractions and didn't have any of those one-way valves in your lymphatic vessels or veins. If you relax the muscles, the lymph and the, even the blood in the veins would fall back downward and all those muscle contractions you just did would have been done in vain. But instead, you do have those one-way valves to ensure once you get that lymph past a certain point, it won't leak back down even if you stopped moving for a few moments. And for you fitness junkies out there, this is another reason why movement and exercise can be so beneficial for circulation as it helps to return lost fluid back to the bloodstream. And one last really cool FYI I want to mention. Many of you have probably experienced an injury that resulted in swelling, like an ankle sprain for example. Much of this swelling is due to the tearing of the tissues like the ligaments as well as the capillaries in that area. So literally blood spills out of those torn capillaries and starts to fill that interstitial space resulting in the swelling. And part of the healing process is that the lymphatic system removes that excess fluid. And we often try to help the lymphatic system along with this process by using things like compression and elevation of an injured body part. Now part of the swelling also has to do with the inflammatory response, but we'll get into that in another video. Now many of you might be thinking, well Jonathan, this info is some of the coolest info I've ever heard, but what about all this talk about the lymphatic system being a major part of your immune system? Well, that is a great question. So we have this amazing drainage system, but what if this drainage system picked up some foreign invaders such as viruses, bacteria, and other pathogens that were trying to infect our tissues and cells? How do we ensure that these nasty little invaders don't make it back to the bloodstream? Well, we have these cool little checkpoints or little military bases that we have built into the system and we call them lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are bean-shaped structures that are strategically placed between lymphatic vessels and on average, the human body contains six to 700 lymph nodes concentrated in areas like the neck, armpits, groin, and abdomen. The lymphatic vessels deliver the lymph into the lymph nodes, and once inside, the lymph percolates throughout the node, encountering a dense network of ninja assassins, also known as white blood cells, such as macrophages, B cells, and T cells, that are ready to fight and mount an immune response against any of these foreign pathogens. Now, at some point in your life, you've probably noticed your lymph nodes swelling up when you got sick. This happens because your immune cells have encountered a pathogen and are working to fight off an infection. And the term for an enlarged T 
tender lymph node is called lymphadenopathy. But the swelling usually goes down once the infection is under control. So as you can see, without a functioning lymphatic system, your body would be in some serious trouble. Excess fluid would accumulate in your tissues and infections would be a major problem. Now for all of you anatomy and physiology nerds out there, you may have also learned that the lymphatic system is also involved in absorbing fat in your digestive tract. But for today, this is a teaser because we're going to cover that in a fat absorption video a little bit later on in the future. But one last thing I do want to mention today is about cancer. Certain cancers such as lymphoma directly target the lymphatic system, affecting its ability to filter lymph and coordinate immune responses. Plus, other cancers that don't specifically target the lymphatic system, some of those cancer cells can metastasize or spread from their original site to another site in the body by traveling through the lymphatic system. And maybe you've heard of someone having lymph nodes biopsied for cancer cells and even lymph nodes and lymphatic vessels removed due to this potential spread through the lymphatic system. And one of the side effects of this is that the person will often start to experience swelling in that area due to having a diminished capacity to drain the interstitial space because of the removal of those lymphatic vessels and lymph nodes.